Good morning. Well, a very warm welcome to everyone, whether you're here in church with me or uh, joining us at home. Uh, it's lovely to all be together and uh, together in spirit, uh, if not physically, for some of us. Can I say a special welcome as I look round um, the, the congregation who are here today, as with former weeks, I see one or two faces. It's the first time that I've seen you for a while. It's lovely to have uh, folk each week um, coming back to church for the first time since everything was shut down. And uh, so special welcome if this is your first time back in church. And as I said, uh, equally a welcome to those who are joining us uh, from their own homes, including those who will be watching this later as a video recording. Uh, it's exactly the same for you because you too are joined with everyone else uh, by God's Spirit. Um, we continue to worship with all sorts of limitations to what we can do. I'm, I'm acutely conscious that um, a lot of our worship might appear on the face of it to be little more than uh, sitting at home or in church listening to and watching me. And uh, if that's how it feels to you, well, I must apologise on the one hand, but also encourage you to uh, see worship as something which we join in in such a variety of ways and my role is, is no more than to give a focus uh, and a sort of drawing together of those threads of everybody's offer of worship to the Lord. But equally I, I do apologise that you see so much of me at the moment and of course in due course I'm sure that um, restrictions will be a little bit looser, we'll be able to uh, do a greater variety of things within our worship. One thing we still can't do at the moment is sing, uh, at least not with our voices. We can sing with our hearts and so we will be having some songs of worship as we have in previous weeks. And uh, of course words to say together as well and in fact we're going to begin with that now. We're going to greet one another in the Lord's name uh, as always with the um, words on the screen do join in with any that are printed in gold. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. And let's worship God together with these words. These are a very, this is a very ancient Christian hymn of praise and glory to God. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We're now going to worship God with a, a hymn based on some words of prophecy from the Old Testament. Uh, the words will be on the screen and join in in your own way. Uh, our, we're accompanied by some of our own local musicians who've recorded at home and then mixed the uh, music together to lead us in how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news.
we are so blessed to have a God who loves us more than we can ever imagine. And as part of that loving relationship, he's ready to forgive us when we go wrong. And that's why confession forms part of our worship. So we're going to share together in a prayer of confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So, let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to have our Bible reading now. It's brought to us by one of those folk who is uh, joining us from home this morning, uh, but has previously prepared this reading for us. It's taken from Acts of the Apostles, and you might recall that over, this is the third week now, that uh, we're looking together at uh, a snapshot or a few snapshots of the life of the early church. And I'll just remind you that last week we heard about the death of Stephen, the first person to give his life for his faith in Jesus. And uh, this part of the story picks up just after the death of Stephen. From the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. 
As they travelled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much to Richard. A short prayer before we reflect together on that story. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. Open your word now to our hearts and our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm sure I'm not uh, unique if I tell you that from time to time I have moments of despondency. It tends to happen uh, when I look in my diary for the week and I see something that was planned as part of uh, this year's programme in our church and uh, of course it's not happening. So for instance we had a series of visiting speakers booked for our Sunday services, one of them uh, for this month of August, and they were going to come and tell us about the work that they're doing from Tear Fund, from the Gideons, from Church Pastoral Aid Society, and from Open Doors. They were all planned and booked. And uh, they, as we hear from people like that, they can really increase our vision and our enthusiasm for what God is doing, the, way, the ways in which God is at work in the world and how we can be part of that and share in it and support it. But we've not heard from any of them. And uh, of course there are other things which are just part and parcel of the life of our church, those events through which we come together to deepen and strengthen our faith, our regular home groups, Bible studies, our regular prayer meeting. Needless to say, our Sunday services too, and the various sermon series that, uh, that we had planned as part of this year's programme. Not to mention uh, the ev activities of our junior church and our youth church. They're still in my diary, but they've not been happening. Or our midweek events, our outreach through our church guild, uh, or to, to, to the older folk of our community, or uh, praise and play to the youngest of our community, our weddings, our baptisms, uh, the work we've been doing to improve and enhance our building, not to mention, of course, uh, the plans we had this year under the title Upward and Onward uh, for building in that more fundamental sense, the spiritual building of our church. And just recently, the, uh, the, the fourth date passed for these four vision meetings that, uh, that we had planned, we booked the uh, village hall for. We were going to uh, gather together and listen to each other and to God to try to discern the ways in which uh, God wants to build with us going into the future. Not to mention all of the day-to-day -day unplanned opportunities that the life and mission and ministry of our church throws up. The comings together of people, the opportunities I have as a vicar to meet so many people, the opportunity to welcome folk into our fellowship here Sunday by Sunday. So much can feel that uh, we have lost so much uh, in recent months. And that feeling, of course, is shared by others in in their own places, their, uh, in their place of work, or their business, uh, or at school, or at home, or in families. I'm well aware that it's a universal uh, feeling at the moment. Well, if I am tempted to despondency, and if you are too, as you think of uh, our church and what we might have missed out on, then take heart from the reading that we heard just now. The story 
uh, well, primarily the story of Philip, but more widely the story of what happened when everything seemed to go wrong for the church. It wasn't so different in a way in that things were going really well. We heard a couple of weeks ago that week by week and day by day, new members were being added to the church. People were hearing the gospel, were believing, the church was growing. We heard last week, didn't we, that they had to adapt and uh, they had to appoint those seven deacons to uh, deal with the administration uh, and, and the organising of this growing body of people. And then we also heard last week that the opposition came, that Stephen uh, was killed, by stoned to death by a mob, and then that was the, the beginning of a great persecution. And it seemed like, it must have seemed like, everything that, uh, that they'd managed to build up that was going so well had suddenly been swept away as this great wave of persecution broke out. We're told that Saul was at the helm of the persecution and he was going from house to house, dragging people out of the house and putting them in jail. And that meant that a lot of the believers scattered away from Jerusalem and uh, fled to the surrounding towns and villages. But that was not going to stop God. It might have seemed like a disaster to the people at the time, to the church members, but God had other ideas. And he turned this apparent disaster into a wonderful opportunity for the church to grow in ways that they had not even considered before. Because what happened was that, the, as we heard, those who were scattered, wherever they went, they took the message with them. And as an example of that, an example of just how effective that was in spreading the Christian message even more like wildfire than before when it was just in Jerusalem, as an example of that, we now focus down onto one example, to Philip. Now, Philip, I ought to mention, was actually, we, we touched on him, on him last week because he was one of those seven deacons like Stephen. Um, so that's, that's what we know about him so far. And he went off... <coughs> Where he ended up, well, it was Samaria. And we're told that uh, he proclaimed the Messiah there. That's what, that's what uh, it says in the text. And we're told that people um, paid close attention to what he said and people came to faith in Christ. And not only that, but uh, Philip's words... Persuasive words, I'm sure, were accompanied by very persuasive signs as well. People are healed. People, are, uh, we're told, uh, have uh, delivered of unclean spirits as well. So there are amazing things happening. People's lives are being touched in all kinds of ways. The Spirit of God is at work through Philip and, and in Samaria. So... It was okay after all, wasn't it? It was all for the best, so it turns out. And the church and the gospel, uh, the church continues to grow, the gospel continues to spread. And then what does God do? But repeat that cycle all over again, because just as things are going really well for Philip in Samaria, he gets a word from the Lord. It's, uh, we're told that an angel of the Lord brings him a message and tells him to leave Samaria and go where? Not to another populated place, but to the desert. To walk down the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. A road which almost by definition will be devoid of people. Now, we're not told what Philip thought about this, we're just told he obeyed. But I'd be surprised if he didn't at least think, well, hang on a minute, Lord. It's all going so well here, I can see why you brought me uh, to here, but I can't see why you would want me to leave here now. It's all going so well. Now, why uh, can't we just leave things as they are? But the Lord had other ideas, and just as things were going so well, once again, it's all broken up, Philip is moved on. But that's because the Lord knows what he's doing, and we know what uh, was planned, because uh, it's through Philip walking down this apparently empty road 
that he comes into contact with the official from Ethiopia who's been to Jerusalem, he's now returning home, he's uh, an adherent of the Jewish faith, he's following the, uh, the, the Jewish faith and uh, he's been to Jerusalem for that reason. Now he's going home and the Spirit tells Philip to just go and walk alongside his chariot and he does and well you know the rest is history. A conversation is struck up and Philip has the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with him which the man gladly receives. Clearly his heart was prepared to receive that good news and uh, he, he's, uh, he comes to faith and as a sign of that he asks Philip to baptise him. They pass a, a little pool, they, he's baptised and then guess what, once again Philip isn't allowed to just sit back and now enjoy the, 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 the glow of this uh, wonderful success. He's once again taken off by God to yet another place. But the point is of course that what had, might have seemed to be a very unpromising situation, the desert road, turned out to be the most promising encounter Philip could possibly have had because no doubt this influential man now goes back to Ethiopia and once again uh, the gospel is shared in a new place. So God has more than one way of building his church. We had our own plans for what that was going to look like this year here at St Christopher's and those plans have not worked out. But one thing we can be sure of is that God will always be true to his promise that he will build his church. The question is, how is he going to do it in the future? We don't know, but we really must hold on in faith to that certainty that he will do it and that he will do it uh, through uh, the current circumstances. I've already seen ways in which, and I'm sure some of you have, certain opportunities that have arisen that we wouldn't have had uh, for our mission and for our ministry and who knows what lies ahead. But I do just want to make one final point and I think it's an important one about this because we've always said, haven't we, as we've spoken here about building the church, that it's God's work rather than ours primarily, but that we are called to be fellow builders with him. So in that sense, it's a joint project between ourselves and God. So whatever lies ahead is going to involve God's initiative and God's leading, but it's also going to involve our obedience. And we see that too in this story. Because did you notice that the people who were scattered, they, they didn't just hide away and lick their wounds and cower. Wherever they went, Philip included, they spoke boldly and enthusiastically about the faith that they had. They shared it. They, they were already so full of, of faith, of, uh, so full of God's Holy Spirit, they, they had grown themselves in their faith to a point where they had a confidence and they were able then to share that with others. Notice when Philip comes alongside the Ethiopian official in his chariot, the official's reading from the, the, from the prophecy of Isaiah, from the Old Testament. And Philip is able to pick up uh, on that reading that, the, that the, the official is reading and isn't really understanding and using his knowledge of the scriptures and his knowledge of the Christian story, he is able to lead the man to faith. So we have a job to do too. We have to be ready to speak of our faith, to take up the opportunities that God will present us with. And of course, to prepare ourselves too, to get to know the scriptures, to spend time drawing close to God in prayer and uh, through reading our Bibles so that we are better prepared, like Philip and those first Christians, to take advantage of whatever God is going to do in our midst with us and through us in the days to come. Amen. We're going to have a hymn. Uh, this one is going to be uh, uh, accompanied by uh, some Church of England musicians. 
And uh, it's a wonderful hymn about following Jesus. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? This affirmation of faith that we're now going to share in together is uh, based on uh, some words from one of Peter's sermons in Acts of the Apostles. So let's join with those first Christians in affirming our faith in Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, shown to be from God by his signs and power, handed over to us in the plan of God, crucified by our sinful hands. We believe in Jesus Christ, raised by God from the dead, freeing him from death's power, for death could not hold him. We believe in Jesus the exalted, ascended to the right hand of God, who received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured this Spirit on his people. We believe, we repent, we receive God's forgiveness. We believe, we rejoice, we receive God's Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we're going to have our prayers uh, led by Kath and Duncan Matheson. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Heavenly Father, as we come before you in prayer, make us aware of you coming to meet us. Make us sensitive to your presence and alert to your call. Almighty God, thank you that the early church was made up of ordinary people like us, and yet it changed the world. Scattered by persecution and blessed by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the believers preach the good news of our redemption through the death and resurrection of Jesus to both crowds and cities and individuals like the Ethiopian. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, 
and diligent in our prayerful requests that the Spirit would make the hearts of those we speak to receptive to your word. We thank you for David, John and Lynn who bring us your word at St Christopher's and for all those whose untiring work helps keep our community learning more of you and supportive of each other. We pray too for our missionary partners, the Fazakalis in Malawi and the Maclean's in Thailand that their efforts to make the gospel known would be blessed with success. Amen. Lord, thank you for the brilliant sunshine we've enjoyed recently and for the rain which has refreshed the land. We pray for your beautiful world, home to all your precious peoples. Help us to live responsibly and to protect your precious gift of creation. We pray for those who are already experiencing the serious effects of climate change, such as droughts, floods and storms. May the innovative farming techniques, which enable crops to grow and families to be fed, be made widely available where they are needed. May organisations such as Christian Aid and Tear Fund be effective in their work, helping lift people out of poverty. Amen. God our Father, in the dying and rising of your Son Jesus Christ, you have brought life and salvation out of cruelty and death. We mark the 75th anniversary of victory in Japan by remembering with gratitude the courage of the armed forces and civilians who suffered for freedom in the Far East campaign. Give us wisdom to learn from the bitter memories of war and hearts that long for the unity of all nations. Heavenly Father, may your peace come to those places where conflict still rages. We ask this in the name of Jesus, in whom there is no east or west, no north or south, but one fellowship of love across the whole earth. Amen. Heavenly Father, you promised to cover those who trust you, trust in you with your feathers and to provide refuge under your wings. We pray for all who, like those in the early church, are persecuted for loving you. We are confident that ultimately you will relieve their suffering, but meantime enable them to be steadfast in their faith and bless the efforts of organisations like Open Doors and Barnabas Fund who provide practical and emotional support to our victimised brothers and sisters. Amen. Father God, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. We bring before you those places where injustice is the norm, where leaders cling to power against the wishes of the people and where opposition is cruelly suppressed. Please grant all those who govern wisdom, discernment and a desire to do your will. We pray particularly for Lebanon and Belarus. Thank you for everyone who uses their talents and time to improve the lives of those who are disenfranchised and downtrodden. Lord, thank you that the rule of law is upheld in the UK. But please help us to strive to make our society one of equal opportunity for all. Amen. Lord, when I said my foot was slipping, your love, O oh Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Heavenly Father, we bring before you all those who are worried about their future, whether they have concerns about a relationship, or their financial situation, or exam results, or their or their family's health. We pray too for the ill in mind or body, for those recently injured, and for the bereaved, including the Snelson family. Please grant them all peace of mind, secure in the knowledge that wherever life leads us, Christ always goes before to prepare a place for us. He is on the road we tread. Christ is our light in the dark, the presence in our loneliness, 
the strength in our weakness, the guide in our lostness, always ready to carry not only our burdens, but also us if need be. Merciful, Merciful Father, Father, accept, accept these, these prayers for the, for the sake, sake of your Son, our, our Saviour, Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord. Lord. Amen. Continue in prayer as we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And today is not the feast of St Philip, but we will have the collect for St Philip as our final prayer. O God, who has made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near, grant that we, following the example of your servant Philip, may bring your word to those who seek you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're almost at the uh, end of our service. Uh, there's not much to tell you in the ways of notices. It's quiet in August anyway, and particularly quiet this August. Uh, but I would remind you that, um, especially if you're joining us uh, via the live stream, um, there's an opportunity to uh, have a chat together over Zoom, uh, starting at quarter to 12, hosted by ha Sandy Milsom. And um, it's a bit chilly here for us who uh, last week enjoyed mingling in the uh, churchyard with a, some of us with a cup of coffee in our hands. But um, uh, if, you, if you're robust and you uh, are well wrapped up, do stay and have a chat outside afterwards if you can. Um, on Tuesday, as always, at seven, we set time aside as a church to pray for our world, but also to pray for God to build and continue to use uh, us here as a church at Potts Wrigley. So do uh, join us if you can, do join in prayer at seven o'clock on Tuesday. Um, our thoughts are very much with um, Erin and Will who are going to be married here next Saturday and uh, then the following day, the Sunday, we'll be here again for our 8.30 service of uh, morning prayer and this morning worship service at quarter to 11. You're very welcome to be here. Um, please let Duncan Matheson, you saw him on the screen just now, please let Duncan know if, uh, if you plan to come, if you'd like to come and we can uh, plan the seating accordingly. Just one more note on our Sunday services. Looking ahead, uh, our 8.30 service on the 6th, which is the first Sunday in September, is going to be a communion service, not quite as you've known it in the past, but um, nevertheless following the current uh, guidelines for how to do communion safely. So we're going to try that on the first Sunday in September. That's at our early service though, the 8.30 service. So the services continue at their normal times uh, and online as well in the coming weeks. Our final hymn then, I mentioned last week we don't uh, take our collection these days, but I did see some envelopes in the plate, so thank you very much if you put one in. Thank you weekly for those who uh, pay by standing order, which I do commend to you. It's a great way to, for your support for church to go on week in, week out. And um, our final hymn is all about uh, going out there to a needy world with the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful him and it's going to be played for us by uh, Mary on the organ. The words will be on the screen. We'll each join in in our own way to go forth and tell, O Church of God, awake. <laughs>
Our final prayer. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, accompany us in this day's journey. Dawn on our darkness. Open our eyes to praise you for your creation and to see the work you set before us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life you give in Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.